All right, so this is lecture number one in the five-part lecture series, The Rise and Fall of Christian Civilization. And I've titled it this way for reasons that you'll see as the class goes on, but what we're also talking about, you have to understand what we're talking about when we're talking about Christian civilization is we're really talking about Western civilization, and that's what this course is going to attempt to give you a grasp on is Western civilization. And the reasons you might want to do that are manifold. I mean, if you live in any part of Western civilization or you've lived in any place that's been affected by Western civilization, so 90% of the world, then you're going to want to have some grasp on the ideas that characterize Western civilization or that have influenced all of the context, historical, political, economic, religious, social, that you live in today. So in other words, this is relevant to everyone or anyone, let's say, who wants to understand any part of the world that we live in by understanding its history. And this is relevant today because people want to talk today about how do we get here? Where do we come from? Why is the cultural, social, political landscape the way that it is at its deepest level, at the level of its core values? And Western values, you know, what are the values of Western civilization is something that's become something of a recent hot topic. Are they terrible? Are they good? You will find out for yourself and you can evaluate when you're done with this course. So in this course, The Rise and Fall of Christian Civilization, I want to assert that Western Civ is basically characterized by two fundamental paradigm shifts historically. The first one is the shift from the Greco-Roman world uh, to Christianity. So this is a religio-philosophical shift, but it influences everything else about the culture, right? And then the second thing is the shift from a genuinely Christian civilization to a modern one. And what we mean by that is a secular way of thinking about the world. So these two shifts kind of bookend the Middle Ages, right? So you have... If you saw, it would be helpful if you saw my uh, introduction to Western ideas video in which I cover just kind of the big picture overview of what we're going to go into detail in in these five lectures. But basically, in that video and here, you see how the Greco-Roman world shifting to Christianity and the Christian world shifting to secularism form these bookends. So uh, you have, like, imagine a timeline here, you know, you have about, let's say, 600 BC to 500 BC to 500 AD and that's kind of more or less the pagan antiquity world and then 500 to 1500 and that's sort of the Christian Middle Ages and then 1500 to today 2000 is the modern world and secularism so these events constitute sort of the major time stamps in that story so we're going to talk about both of them and today, specifically, we want to talk about how Christianity, like the first one mainly, right? How Christianity emerged in the ancient world, which is a very weird story. And it's weirder than you think, and it's more strange and bizarre than you think. So, in the pagan world, there's a few things that you have to understand that are totally alien to our modern way of thinking. Because we are the inheritors of all sorts of values liberalism and democracy and concept of human rights and concept of personal freedom and, and this sort of thing. Almost all of that would be completely alien to our pagan ancestors. That's the main thing I want to emphasize to you. So what, what was their landscape like? Well, the first one is something that I alluded to in the, le in the last lecture, which is the cosmic hierarchy. And what this means is that for the pagans, the entire world was part of a singular hierarchical structure that included all the political and social and cultural levels of society, you know, poor slaves, uh, poor people, merchant class, whatever, ruling class, however the society was stratified in Athens or Sparta or Rome or wherever. But then it also included all of the gods and the demigods and, and the cosmic hierarchy, and they're all connected 
for the ancient world because for them, the concept of a separation of church and state would have been incoherent. For them, everything was a religious function. Everything like running the state was a religious function. When you drew boundaries for new territories, it, they, they had pagan priests there because it was much as much a religious rite as it was a political function. So everything's tied together for them. And so the cosmos has this incredible unity and orderliness to it and structure to it. And the cosmos is bigger than you, right? There's not really a place in this sort of grand cosmic hierarchy for too much individual importance. I mean, obviously individuals were important, but in the end, man is still subject to nature. He's still subject to fate and he's still subject to the gods. And this is something that you probably will have a hard time understanding. The ancients actually feared their gods. They loved their gods. They revered their gods. They propitiated their gods. They feared their gods because the gods governed the universe. They were part of that cosmic hierarchy. You know, you may think that the ruling class in, say, Rome kind of just exercised their monolithic power over everybody, but they too were the slaves to the gods in a certain sense. Everybody was a slave to the gods and the gods, if you've read any Homer or any, watched any, you know, adaptations of the Odyssey or whatever, you know that the gods are capricious, vindictive, uh, full of all kinds of vices. They lose their temper. They get jealous. They, they destroy cities of mortals. Uh, there was a princess, I forget which one, who, who claimed to be more beautiful than the Nereids, the, the sea nymphs. And I believe Poseidon, in, in, in his jealousy, then sent a, a kraken or something to destroy, to destroy their whole city because of this. So the gods didn't suffer man to rise up too far or he would be put back in his place. And the story of, of Daedalus and Icarus, you fly too high and then the sun burns and you fall into the ocean and die. All this structure in pagan stories and culture is about Man has to know his place in the cosmic hierarchy, and everyone is ultimately a slave to the gods in a certain sense. I mean, you still have some freedom within that, but it's a world that's ruled by terrifying and brutal powers, and it created a culture of, as one scholar put it, boundless cruelty, actually, and we'll get into that in a second. But that's, that's, the under, that's the socio-cultural, political understanding of the ancient world is also a cosmic one. That's my point. And then it's not, a, it's not a pretty picture. It's sort of a brutal picture. Now, the Greeks, there is, since we're on the topic of Greek religion, the Greco-Roman pantheon in general, uh, let's talk about what they meant by God just very briefly. Uh, and it would be as something utterly transcendent because the can't talk and write. Okay, because the the ancients weren't just polytheists. They believed in many gods and Christians and Jews or whatever narrowed it down to only one god. That's a totally anachronistic way of looking at their world. For for the ancients, there was a whole pantheon of gods and demigods and spirits and muses and things, but Many, there was such a thing as Greek monotheism that, in, that wasn't at odds with that. It included all of that. You know, underneath, or let's say above all that sort of hierarchy of divine beings, there was something at the top, some ultimate source of power, some first mover that governed all the others or maybe created all the others or something like that. It was kind of vague, and it depended on who you asked. Plotinus called it the one. Uh, many called it the god. Uh, that would be a weird translation of the Greek, hatheos. But whatever the case is, this conception how, was very dim for the Greeks and, for their, and then consequently for the Romans and others. It was an utterly transcendent thing. If such a power existed, and pretty much everybody thought it did, it was so beyond and so transcendent that it almost had nothing to do with human beings. It certainly wasn't something you would appeal to the way that the Christians would later then be like, oh, I'm going to pray to God for something. No, the, the things that you interacted with, the things that you sacrificed to and propitiated to and tried to defend yourself from and tried to appease uh, were the, let's call them the, the lower gods, the, the petty gods, the deities of the, the Roman, the Greco-Roman pantheon. So that won't matter later. Okay, what's the, what's the third thing? So... This is the one that I think 
well, that I hope will, will shock you a little bit, right? This is the thing you really need to wrap your head around. In the ancient world, uh, there was no such thing as the person. Now, what do I mean by that? The person is a big deal for us modern people because we believe that all human beings are endowed with equal dignity and value and every human being is worth something and, and all this kind of talk which you're very familiar with because it's your culture. But for the ancients, no such thing as the person existed in any robust way at all. So quick etymological breakdown, person comes from the Latin word persona, which kind of means a mask. Uh, it's something. Why that is, is another story. But it's something that you, it's your face, the face that you put on before the law, generally speaking, but also kind of toward your, toward your social relations or the rights you have before the state. You know, the, the state acknowledges a face that you have before. You have a persona before the face, or before the state, your face in front of the state. That's not who you are intrinsically, it's the face that you wear. And... Why does that matter? Well, not everybody had a persona. Uh, condemned men who were condemned to death didn't have one. Uh, Non-noble-born people, like born un under the barbarians, uh, weren't, you know, especially non-citizens. They didn't have a face before the law. Slaves didn't have a face in this sense. Lots of people couldn't vote in the famous... Athenian democracy of old, right? Most of the population couldn't vote because about half of them were slaves, roughly speaking. So not everyone was a person in a pretty literal sense. Uh, some, under some emperors, sometimes slaves had, had rights and, and certain kinds of rights, but their testimony wasn't valid in court, things like that, because they didn't have a persona before the law. This is me holding up like a like a stick with a mask on it, you know, like in the old kind of theater. That was your persona that you put on. So this didn't exist. And the consequence, the social consequence of this not existing was huge because the ancient world was characterized by all sorts of savage brutality that today we would find crazy. I'll give you some examples. Uh, so the, exp the, w <laughs> the exposure of infants. So it's not like they practiced abortion exactly the way we did. They let the child be born, and if they didn't want the child, they would take the child and kill it by exposure, which means they go out and just sort of set it down in the woods and leave. And maybe it could be rescued, or maybe you know, but probably animals would just eat it or would starve to death, right? And so they would just throw children away that they didn't want in this fashion, you know, and let the kid be eaten by wolves or something. They would, well, the Colosseum, is a great example. I mean, we kind of glorify the Colosseum in, in, in pop culture in retrospect. It was, a, it was a savagely brutal institution. They would, they would buy slaves and force them to fight to the death, and they would take prisoners that they captured in war and, and force them to perform all sorts of horrible things, murder each other, all this kind of stuff. You really have to think about how the extent of the brutality of the Colosseum system and, and, and that it was a form of entertainment is is maybe something that you would dismiss because of course there's all sorts of brutality in modern film and video games and whatever but understand that you know those things are fake and in the Coliseum they're real they would they would buy people and then make them fight each other to the death like and then the crowd would sit there and cheer for it I mean when you cheer for the bad guy getting killed in a movie you know the actor is fine right so it's a very different kind of qualitatively different thing. They did all sorts of dehumanizing things to prisoners. Uh, all sorts of, they would just mass execute whole groups of people, whole kinds of households. And, and a good example is, and a horrifying example is, when men were condemned to die, often, sometimes, many times, a practice was to take the condemned men and cast them in plays and then force them to perform these lines and to be on stage and all this stuff. And then at whatever point in the play it was appropriate, the, the other actors would kill them on stage uh, for, the, for the novelty and the spectacle so that the audience could see someone die live on stage. And that would somehow make the film more, or the, the play more exciting. And I guess it, it would. But could just imagine 
being condemned and then forced to die for the entertainment of other people in front of other people. And everybody's just fine with this, right? That's, that's a brutal kind of culture for all the things we say about the glory of classical civilization, which are also true. But understand that these things happen, these, these sort of dehumanizing things happen on the basis that there's no such thing as the person. The person has no intrinsic human dignity. And there's so many examples you could, you could come up with. I mean, anyone who was weak or crippled, orphans, widows, prisoners, criminals, uh, if you didn't have a function, then you didn't have value. There was no intrinsic value to the human person. You were valuable insofar as you could do things for society. And if you couldn't, then you weren't valuable. It's pure, pure utilitarianism in a certain sense, like pure utilitarianism pure utilitary value, let's say. And then slavery, which is a, which is a constant characteristic of, of the ancient world, is the basic kind of understanding of the subjugation of the inferior to the superior. In other words, if you were dumb and all you could do was grind cornmeal, then you were probably only fit to be a slave. They saw slavery as a natural institution. It wasn't race-based. It wasn't arbitrary like that. But it was... It was just like, well, some people are born noble, and they have high IQ, and they're good at things, and they're beautiful, and they're charismatic, and they're quick on their feet. And then those people can be like noble-born citizens. They really cared about this stuff because you, you had function. You had value. And if you didn't have a bunch of talents, if you weren't talented in anything, then you were only fit to be a slave. Right, so it's a, like many other cultures, like old Eastern cultures that had caste systems, they were fundamentally based on utility value because nobody thought that just because you were, hi, I'm a person, that you had any value at all. Not really. Why would you? There's no reason for it on this kind of system. So what are the results of a world like this? Well. Contrary to a lot of the sort of historical propaganda of the, let's say, the Renaissance humanists or whatever, the, when we look at the writings and the sort of religious or spiritual movements of the ancient world, they're fairly characterized by, fairly generally characterized by a sort of cosmic ennui, a sort of, sort of wide-scale depression and longing for escape, despair of the material world, despair of the spirit pardon me, despair of this cosmic hierarchy uh, and, a, and a longing to, to be free of the bonds of, of death and of necessity and all this kind of things. And there were so many mystery religions that, that popped up promising, promising escape from the body but, or escape from all this you know, cosmic hierarchy and suffering, but they did it through escape from the body. They thought, well, the body and matter and all the changeable things, they're impermeable, they don't last. We have to get rid of them. We have to escape from them. And, and there were various manifestations of this. Uh, but the point is that this is not the most uplifting paradigm, right? It's kind of depressing. And you, we see that in the religions and in the, the cults and things that came up that came up to free the ancients from this kind of system. So real quick footnote before we move on to how Christianity comes up and, and changes all of this is, is Judaism. You might say, well, Judaism is an ancient religion and it, and it doesn't really have all of this stuff. It, it, it offers some other kind of hope. Sort of. I think that's kind of a backwards reading from modernity till then. Remember that in ancient Judaism, Yahweh is not, Yahweh is very particular. He wants them to behave in certain ways, and there's no sort of robust concept of heaven and escape. They have to reject a lot of material things. That's what kosher law is about, and reject the things that the other nations do. And so there is the same kind of theme of this detachment, not in the same way, obviously, but, but that those elements are there. And the most important thing is, is the ethnocentrism of Judaism. In no way does Judaism at this time in the ancient world think that there's some kind of like inherent dignity to all human beings. It's, it's for, Judea for Judaism, right? The Gentile is inferior to the Jew because he does all these barbaric pagan practices. He worships the false gods. 
he's dirty and unclean, literally, by kosher law standards. So there is a real ethnocentric element in ancient Judaism. Uh, is it a precursor? Are, are there theo deep theological elements in ancient Judaism that are precursors to historic Christianity? Of course, of course. But that's our privilege looking back to see that at the time, that wouldn't, it wouldn't have been clear to them that all men are made in the image of God, something like that. Uh, certainly not in the way, not in the robust way that will happen when we come to Christianity. So let's do that. So three things happen that Christianity introduces to the ancient world that are brand new, brand new. No one anywhere in any culture in human history had ever suggested anything at the sort of paradigmatic magnitude that ancient Christianity introduced into the into the ancient world, and it caused a massive paradigm shift in the way everyone thought about everything, which you'll see in the next lecture. But let's outline them. So the first one is the incarnation. The incarnation, meaning you know the enfleshment, is about how God became man, and it's really important to understand what this means. It doesn't mean that God kind of appeared to people in the form of a man. It doesn't mean that this guy, Jesus, became such a morally pure and perfect person that he ascended to Godhood. It means that the God of the universe, this transcendent thing here that we talked about in the pagan context, that that thing that was utterly unknowable previously suddenly entered into humanity and took on human flesh, God and man, together. Not neither one overshadowing the other. Fully God, fully man is the formula for Jesus that the ancient Christians came up with. And that formula makes possible all the other theology. We'll get into that later. What's the point, though, of this for our purposes? It means that several things. One, it means that this God, this, this ancient, tr transcendent, unknowable power, suddenly becomes knowable. And not just knowable, but he's entered into the world and become part of mankind. This is a total inversion of the cosmic hierarchy of the ancient pagan world because that cosmic hierarchy, gods, the gods rule, and we are the slaves of the gods, and we need to do what they say and propitiate them or bad stuff's going to happen. Instead, the god that's higher than those gods comes down into the universe and suddenly uh, becomes the servant of mankind helping and healing, doesn't need to be propitiated, doesn't ask for sacrifices, he turns everything on its head. In this amazing outpouring of unconditional love uh, for all mankind, God reveals himself in a way that's totally alien to the pagan gods. And what does he do? He cares for all the weak and useless people, the slaves, the orphan, the widows, the children, the lame, the sick, the blind, the infirm. All of a sudden, he's going to these people, the lepers, the people who don't have value on any of these systems and saying, no, you have, you have value. You need healing. You need my help. I'm here to help you and love you and heal you. So it's an incredible outpouring of compassion for all all of the people who are the least valuable on the old pagan system. So that's a big deal. But there's two other things that I think are really important about this. Is, is one is this sort of image of God thing, right? That, that God fully takes on humanity. And then when Christ ascends to go back to, to the Father, we'll talk about that, what that means later, and sits at the right hand of the Father, that means a human being with flesh, with bones, with a butt, like is sitting at the right hand of the Father, meaning at the height and ruling throne of all creation and reality, there's a human being there. So that is what radically dignifies all human beings. Now suddenly everyone is in the image of God. God is part of humanity now. He's tied it to himself. We all get to share in God's infinite dignity. We're all images of God. So that functionally creates the concept of the person, the person the way we understand it, not just as a face that you have before the law, but as something intrinsic and, most, most importantly, of intrinsic value. 
And that is radical. That doesn't exist on this old paradigm. And it fundamentally, you know, in just a couple centuries, it will change the entire social political landscape. Society will reorient itself around this idea that every single person has intrinsic value. So that's kind of big. And then this is the second thing about the incarnation, is that creation itself can be redeemed. Because remember that all the religions that, that felt this incredible longing to escape the cosmic hierarchy, the slavery to the gods, the inevitability of fate and death and doom and all this stuff, when those religions popped up that promised release from those things, they promised it on the basis of utterly rejecting the world and its pleasures, like the Stoics, for example. So Christianity with the Incarnation doesn't say, okay, everyone, you know, certain people who are smart enough, because that's what these old religions, these old pagan religions would say, if you're enlightened enough and you're smart enough and, you, and you're able to fully reject the world and the body, then you can be saved and you, your spirit can go on and you can leave the corruptible world behind. But Christianity comes in and says, no, creation's good, it's just fallen. Uh, and it can be fixed and God's going to fix it. And to show you that creation itself is good, God is going to take on the disgusting flesh of the human person, of the human like animal, let's say. Uh, and take it into himself and affirm, no, nope, it is good. It's intrinsically good. Everything is intrinsically good. The creation is intrinsically good. It's just in a fallen state, in a corrupted state, and it can be fixed. It can be redeemed. Mankind can redeem. Creation can be redeemed. So it's a totally different perspective. That wouldn't have made any sense to the pagans, and that's why there was a lot of pushback about it. So this transitions to the other thing, which is that... A man came back from the dead. So obviously the resurrection of, of Jesus is kind of a big deal. Man doesn't come back from the dead all the time. Now it's true that there were sort of these mystery kind of mythic conceptions of a dying and rising God scattered all throughout pagan mythology. But a lot of it, it's a mistake to compare them to, to Christianity. They're qualitatively different than the Christian resurrection. A lot of these are mythological in structure, which the pagans interpreted as allegorical, you know, like with different random things like Persephone going to the underworld and coming back. And that's, uh, that's how the seasons, you know, there's spring and then there's winter. So they kind of have these allegorical explanatory myths that involve death and resurrection to make philosophical points about reality. The Christian claim is that an actual person came back from the dead on the basis that he was the transcendent God himself life itself, and life itself cannot die. So, Christ, and we'll get into this in a later lecture, but the whole idea that Christ conquers death, Christus Victus, that's what this is, it's not just that they put Jesus to death and it doesn't stick because he's God and he comes back, that's true, but he also, in coming back from the dead, conquers death. That's a Christian, that's an ancient Christian understanding. The Christ is the victor, he slays death. Uh, one of the patristic images is that death is kind of this, this monster that eats Christ, and Christ poisons the monster, and the monster dies and spits Christ out. This is why they read Jonah, the story of Jonah, as a, as a prefigurement of Christ. The whale is death, you know, the big fish is death, and it eats Jonah. Jonah stands for Christ and all that kind of stuff. So, and then the whale, you know, spits him out. The whale doesn't die in the Jonah story, but you get the idea. So death is defeated. Uh, now, people are still going to die. Why that is, is another topic. But the, the promise of the resurrection is very clear, which is that even if you die, and you will, it won't stick. It won't be permanent, because God has begun a work that's going to draw everyone up out of the grave. And that also inverts and destroys the whole pagan idea of necessity, slavery to nature, uh, bondage to fate, everyone's going to die, that's your fate. Uh, nature is supreme over the person, that's a really important concept here, right? So to the extent that there's a person on the ancient world, uh, nature is superior to it. Or you could say fate, same thing, the cosmos. Uh, but on the Christian idea, it's the person who is superior to nature. And that's, that's obviously a total inversion. So there's hope 
for the first time in the ancient world for anything beyond for beyond slavery to the gods, ultimate death and doom of everybody, right? Depressing, hopeful. <laughs> One other element is of this, the defeat of death, is that ancient Christians said, well, Christ also came and conquered the elemental powers of the world, the demons, meaning the pagan gods. So the ancient Christians, fun fact, did not deny the existence of the pagan deities. They didn't. They said, oh, yeah, those guys are real, but they're assholes. Look at them. They sleep around. They shoot lightning at people when they don't like them. They're vindictive. They change their minds. They're petty. They fight with each other. They're awful. They're demons. They're demons who are consumed by their vices, and they're trying to trick mankind into giving them worship. And they're clearly not people worthy of emulation because they're so full of vice. And Christ has come and conquered them and kicked them all out. And so pagans uh, holding on to this old paradigm were met by Christian refusal, to par Christian refusal to participate in their religious system. Because they said, look, here are demons. Christ has conquered them. We don't need to serve them anymore. We don't need to propitiate to them. They don't control our lives anymore. Christ has conquered us. So to become a Christian in the ancient world was basically this was basically an act of cosmic sedition. That's how one scholar puts it, uh, because you're you're rejecting the entire social, political, and cosmic order of the ancient world that's predicated on man's service to the demons. But the resurrection is a victory, victory for creation. And then there's one other little thing here, which is the Trinity which all of this we will talk about in the Christianity lectures. But the Trinity, complicated issue. What you need to know for now, for our purposes, for the context of this le lecture, is that the Trinity is a community of three persons. So God's nature is a community of persons, and persons are defined as, the, as beings in relation to each other. So in our relations... That's how we have our identity as persons. And it's, of course, a loving community. That's what John means, St. John means when he says God is love. He means that God is this perfect, loving community of persons, all affirming and loving each other and working together. So that's the nature of God. This transcendent thing has been sort of demystified. Now we know what it is. And what it is is a radical affirmation of the person. So it's not because, because remember, too, on the pagan context, at the top of reality, there was some, if there was some kind of transcendent power, the one, the first mover, whatever it was, it was kind of always intrinsically bound by nature. It was some kind of a natural force that had to behave in certain ways. You know, for Plotinus, the one, the one at the top of reality couldn't help but create. He just kind of emanates forth the creation can't really help it. It's part of his nature. So again, even when they conceive of these things, there's still a nature greater than person paradigm. But for Christianity, it's the Trinity, God as Trinity in his love, in his freedom, that he creates out of nothing, out of his free will, and then brings creatures into being that also have free will, that can also participate in loving relationships with each other and with him. So that's, that's another nail in the coffin to this old pagan idea of the person, right? And it, it sort of erects Christianity, this, this, this um, edifice, this foundational edifice that the person is, a, is like the existential or you'd say ontological category for, for your identity. You are a person just like the highest most powerful thing in the universe, like the source of reality, God, uh, is a person too. That's a radical, the most radical affirmation of personhood and the most radical challenge and inversion to this old pagan idea that you could possibly imagine. It was completely unprecedented, and if it wasn't for Christianity, there's no clear reason to me why this formula would have ever changed why we would ever have any, any idea of a radical, a radical dignity to every single person, regardless of their utility value or their IQ or their height or whatever. You know what I mean? So 
you could call it a precursor to the idea of human rights. That's, that's a later thing. But you get the idea. So that's that for that. Next lecture, we're going to look at the effects of these ideas on Western civilization and the transition from pagan antiquity to Christian medieval and how that affects culture at a social, political, economic level, all that kind of stuff. Okay? Until then.